Andre, it's good to meet you for the first time. Hey, Victor. It's good to have you at this conference. Uh, yeah. Um, would you introduce yourself to the viewers? Tell them a little bit about who you are, what you do, what mm -hmm. you like to do. Sure. Yeah, I'm a licensed professional counselor in Pennsylvania, United States, uh, near Philadelphia. I've been in the world of working with people with sexuality struggles since 2006. When I was a student in college, I started up a support group for guys. After doing an internship at a, a counseling center that was part of Exodus International. And I ran that group for eight years and eventually got my master's in counseling. And um, there's a lot of other stuff I can get into with that, mm -hmm. but uh, <laughs> I've experienced some, some trouble in, in grad school because of the work I do. Um, mm -hmm. But then I eventually I got through all that. I uh, now own my own counseling practice as well as I'm the campus counselor at my old college. So uh, my specialty is in working with guys with unwanted same-sex attraction, but also I work with a variety of clients, um, sexual addiction, porn addiction, uh, trauma, uh, various other issues, but mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I have a real passion for working with guys who struggle with their sexuality. Wow, and what, what could you say were some of the greatest issues that you encountered in your early days of counseling those with uh, sexual issues, sexual struggles? Ooh, earlier issues, as in like the, the issues with the clients? Uh, yeah, issues with their struggles. Clients. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, so when I started up the support group at my college, probably the greatest struggle was that they didn't know where they could go. The students on, my, on campus at my college, they didn't know if there was a safe place where they could talk about mm. these issues. And there was no counseling services on campus at the time when I was a student there. Uh, there now are, are services, yeah. uh, but at the time, they really didn't want any sort of counseling. They didn't want a support group. Uh, I had to really work hard to get a group going because the old administration at the school was very much against having any sort of help for students struggling with these issues mm -hmm. because they wanted to punish them rather than help them. Okay. And so that was a big struggle. There was a lot of shame. There's, I mean, this is kind of the main, main issue related to same-sex attraction. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of shame around yeah, it. Yeah. And it was made even worse when you have mm -hmm. a mentality that it's just a... This is just a sin issue and you need to punish people if mm -hmm. they struggle with this instead of really coming to understand more what's, what are the underlying issues. Um, and a lot of the guys, I can't say all, but a lot of them have trauma in the background or at least uh, very overt trauma from abuse. Uh, so the group I ran for years was actually an abuse recovery program, but like half the guys in the group were struggling with same-sex attraction. Mm -hmm. The other half were dealing with heterosexual porn addiction. So uh, trauma was a, a big thing that I had to become proficient in addressing. Mm -hmm. so. And what made you choose this area to work in this field? What makes you passionate mm -hmm. about helping other guys? Yeah, uh, I, th I think God just sort of kept, he, he led me into it really mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. I, I did not have the original intention of working in this sort of field. I wanted to become an art therapist and work with kids, uh, but God kept bringing more people in my life who were struggling with some sort of sexual issue. I had my own history of struggling with, with lust in my teenage years and com some compulsive issues there, but I, I experienced a lot of healing uh, independently, uh, like my last year of high school and going into college. And so I was very passionate about helping guys just know their identity in Christ and mm -hmm. understand the freedom that comes with knowing who, the, who they are and how, how God loves them fully and completely. Um, but my heart was really broken for seeing guys on my college campus who are struggling with this issue and there's no real help. And uh, it really takes serious that the idea in scripture of being your brother's keeper. Mm. And the school kind of at the time had this sort of don't ask, don't tell kind of approach. Yeah. So it, it was something that was overlooked or just wasn't being adequately addressed. And I, as you get to know these guys who are struggling with these issues, I found I had a lot in common. We both have histories of being bullied or loneliness, and my brokenness came out differently than theirs, but mm -hmm. I was able to relate in certain areas. Um, and it just it seemed, and this is the thing that really fires me up, is that we see a huge disservice within the church when we aren't adequately addressing this issue. Now, I came from this working in this area of a very super conservative school where they were more prone to want to punish guys. Yeah. But now we're dealing with the opposite issue in society and the church where they just want to affirm and just make things real easy and just don't really want to address the issue at all. And 
so that we're going from the one extreme being super strict to now being very permissive and just treating it very tritely. Like, okay, yeah, you know, we still agree that it's a sin, but so just don't act on it. But you know, you know, sort of accept that there's something you'll always have. Yeah, this is who you of. are, and there's no message of healing, and mm. there's no hope of overcoming. And in particular, I became a therapist. I studied counseling so that I can actually help people heal, not just help people manage their issues, mm -hmm. but actually help people overcome, find freedom. Wow. So I'm passionate about this issue because this is the one issue I see where the society, but definitely the church, has really neglected to offer hope and healing. Uh, or at least there's been segments in the church that have, but they've been marginalized and been ignored. Um, I have so many friends who've experienced change in their sexuality, but they're treated like they're pariahs. And of course, the society always cast doubt, but it's, it's really awful when the church has that same attitude. Uh, it's very interesting that you mentioned about uh, actually leading people into healing, right? Because mm -hmm. uh, what I noticed in, in the Christian world is that, um, I mean, not, maybe not everybody, but many or a big majority of people, of Christians, they kind of will tell you to stop sinning, to just stop the practice, stop doing that, yeah. stop doing that. It's about the, those rules, that set of rules. And it's interesting that you're actually mentioning healing and restoration recovery from that, right? Mm -hmm. um, do you still find that in today's world there's still some kind of stigma in the Christian world when it comes to counseling and therapy that maybe Christians think that a Christian should not uh, undergo counseling or therapy because they're Christians and they just have to pray and read the Bible all day and it just will happen. Kind yes. Of supernaturally. Yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, there's a lot of division within the church regarding our approach to therapy and just in general, not just regarding sexuality issues, but just in general. We got on one extreme end, you have what we call biblical counseling, just thinks, well, we need to find a verse that has something to do with your issue and you just need to read that passage and believe that truth and just trust God, and that'll, that'll be sufficient. And then you have others on the other extreme end that just are pretty much mainstream counselors who happen to be Christians, but they don't see any, mm. any real relationship that their faith has to their counseling. And so the, in between that, you have people who are integrationists, who believe you can integrate mainstream counseling with your Christian faith. And then you have those who think that actually Christianity offers its own unique approaches to counseling. And so we can we have more to offer than even the secular counseling approaches. Mm. And so I like to fuse those approaches together. Um, a lot of pastors will tend to take more of that biblical approach. And that's, that has its place. That's useful when it comes to discipleship. But they kind of hit a brick wall when it comes to issues that have more deeper emotional issues. Uh, like you mentioned, like, stop it. I just think about this. Uh, this is comedy sketch uh, from... Oh, stop it. Yeah. I know. Yeah. <laughs> the, with Bob Newhart, and he just meets with his client, and she says she has a fear of being buried alive in a box, and he just goes, okay, I'm going to tell you two words, all right? Stop it! <laughs> you know, it's like, and that's the approach that so much of our church yeah. takes. Just, just stop it. It's just a sin issue, so just stop. Yeah, yeah. but, but how it's like, to stop, right? <laughs> there's more to it than sin. There's also yeah. the, you know, brokenness. There's developmental wounds. There's losses. There's distorted ways of thinking. Mm -hmm. And maybe if we had a broader understanding of repentance to include healing, mm -hmm. I can understand that. But most people think of repentance just as stopping sin. And so the other aspects of transformation and change and growth into who God had created you to be get neglected. And so we have an inadequate understanding of what causes the issues that we're dealing with in counseling. So that's my... I can get onto a soapbox with this and go on and on. But. Yeah, that, that would be for a podcast, maybe. <laughs> well, I, I do have a YouTube channel, oh, you Psycho Bible, and I, I re literally just recently did a whole video about this issue because uh, there's so much confusion in the church mm. right now. And, and whether Catholic or Protestant, we're mm -hmm. seeing all the different streams within the church really having an issue with understanding the root issues to same-sex attraction and just emotional issues in general. Mm -hmm. And we need, to, we need to really fix that, get back to an understanding of who we are as humans, how God designed us, what is necessary for us to develop into the humans, like the men and women that God created us to be, and how do we address wounds and deficits and roadblocks to becoming who God created us to be. Oh, yeah.
There's a lot of insights that we have within the church that we just aren't applying. Mm -hmm. It's a very big area, as you said, uh, and you probably already answered this question, but if I asked you what are maybe, let's say, three things that you would mention if I ask you uh, what biblical counseling or biblical therapy would look like, if there are three things that you would mention mm. for someone who's looking to become a, a counselor or a therapist and they would still want to hold on to their Bible, to their beliefs, to their faith, would not want to compromise, but they would also want to have access to good research, to good information, to mm -hmm. good studies and all of that. What would be three things that you would um, encourage them to be careful to? Hmm. Um, well, yeah, don't be so simplistic. And understand that when we talk about God's Word, there's more than the Bible, okay? So when I speak about God's Word, I'm actually speaking about three different things. God's word as in the logos, the logic by which God created all creation. So we can understand that by observation, through general revelation. And so that means that some of the mainstream counseling approaches have validity. We don't need to discard those because they're not rooted in a biblical revelation. Because if there's still revelation from what we observe from humans, from scientific research, then that's still truth. Revelation is revelation, whether it's general or special. And so we can incorporate that. That's still God's creation. His logic is in his creation. Even though we still live in a fallen world, there are certain things that still persist, certain truths that we can still grasp. So that's one. And the other word is obviously scripture, that's special revelation. And so there are, there are insights in scripture that can provide a framework for a counseling approach. And then we can, I, I always believe you, you build that first, you get the framework, you get the scaffolding and the structure to a, a mm -hmm. biblical worldview, and then you plug in more of the secular approaches or mainstream approaches that, that match that if needed, because there's actually quite a lot that you can create just from the, a biblical approach. And then there's God's word, Jesus Christ, the word made flesh, who dwells within us through the Holy Spirit. And so in my counseling, especially when, work, when I'm working with a Christian client. I, I see all sorts of clients, not just Christians. Um, but either way, I'm relying on the Holy Spirit as the wonderful counselor, as the, mm. the, the, the comforter and the spirit of truth. He brings revelation in the sessions. There's times where I don't know what to say and I just trust God to reveal something in the session. Or I'll say something, but the Holy Spirit has a way of making what I say even more impactful. I've, Wow. I was like, oh, that's profound. I'm like, I thought that was pretty basic, but sometimes it hits people a certain way because mm -hmm. the Holy Spirit is in the session and he brings conviction. But uh, so he shows us where we're going wrong. It's not dependent on me. So this is where in a counseling role, it's not my job to convict someone and moralize them, but help them understand what they're feeling, what they're thinking and what's motivating their behaviors. Mm -hmm. And I can do that without... Uh, being harsh and uh, moralizing them and trying to get them to repent. But sort of help them gain insight. And it's amazing how the Holy Spirit then can bring the conviction they realize, I don't want to live like this anymore. I don't want to do that. Oh, this is wrong. Mm. And then he brings comfort. That's the Holy Spirit. He comforts us by revealing that you don't have to stay in your sin. You don't have to stay stuck in this way of thinking. I have a truth. He doesn't just provide us a revelation of our brokenness and our sin, but he brings the solution as well, and that's how he comforts us. Wow. So I rely on all those aspects mm. that God gives us in my counseling. So, so, sounds a bit like inner healing. Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah. Probably they work together, right? Yeah, Wow. definitely. Beautiful, beautiful. What would be one thing that you would recommend to those who struggle with uh, sexual identity, gender identity? Um, what would be let's say, a thing that they should look into in their lives to maybe find a way towards healing, to find the door or a yeah. starting point? First, say, get, take a break from all the uh, navel-gazing and being fixated on what your identity is. Mm. Uh, because the world will tell you your identity is based on your thoughts and your feelings. And it's very subjective. What the world offers you when it comes to identity is this idea that your identity is something subjective you d and you have to discover it or you you develop it yourself and that leaves people even more anxious it leaves them unmoored you need to be anchored to something true something solid and god gave us that he gave us our bodies to guide us and to reveal to us our identities mm. 
So we have to understand that your thoughts aren't all the way out here, and that's who you, that the real you isn't out here in some ethereal, mystical realm, and your body is somehow separate from it. You are your body, and you are your spirit. A human is a spirit body composite. The two things combine. So your body has meaning. It's meant to, to inform you, mm. meant to reveal the person. Yeah. Just like Jesus. Jesus is God in the flesh, and he came to reveal the Father who is spirit. So how do we know who, this, who the Father is and his personality? Jesus. He mm -hmm. came in the flesh to show us that. So you're, in the same way, you're, God gave us bodies to reveal who you are. So we need to be grounded in a reality, and God gave us a, something to actually ground us, our bodies. Your body tells you who you are. When you're struggling with your sexual identity, sexual identity, you don't have to look much further than looking in the mirror. That's my identity. Mm. Get out of this uh, pondering and reflecting and navel-gazing and introspection. That's, we need to get back into your body and realize that's, that's the truth of who I am. And that also informs your sexual orientation. I don't like to use those words. Yeah, I but understand. your body not just tells you what you are, as in male or female, but your body also tells you the direction of your mm. sexual uh, behaviors and relationships. It tells you uh, who you're meant to join with and unite with sexually. It's obvious that men and women are meant to be together in sexual union and in marriage. So wow. your body informs you not just of your identity, but the, the purpose of your sexuality. Mm -hmm. And we need to get grounded in that. Wow, wow that's powerful, yeah. Yes. And finally, what, what, what comment or suggestion um, would you have for uh, those who um, are enrolling for the IFTC learning platform that we've been creating lately, okay. where your sessions are also going to be yeah, I'm available. Excited about that. So, <laughs> now, the whole uh, IFTCC learning is just amazing. It's such a resource. So I would just say dive in. Uh, there's going to be some amazing presentations on there. There already are uh, some really amazing presentations. So just go to town, go crazy. Uh, you know, learn as much as you can. Mm -hmm. This is such an invaluable resource, and this is something that we've sorely needed for such a long time. Uh, a lot of the other conferences, like I, I participate in the Alliance for Therapeutic Choice and Scientific Integrity. I've been going to their conferences, conferences since 2016, and most of those, we don't have the recordings available, or we mm. have, they're not posted online. And so there's so much good, valuable information, but it's like you have to go to a conference to get it. Well, here you can get it online. Take advantage of that. <laughs> um, I've been trying with my YouTube channel just to give this information out because wow. us therapists in this field, we actually want what we do to be known. Yeah. We're not secretive about mm. what we do. We actually want the information out there. We want research. We want to be scrutinized. Go ahead. I mean, I'm pretty confident about what I do and, and how safe and effective it is. So I don't mind being scrutinized, but we actually want to inform the public and we want to dispel myths. And so the best way you can do that is watching the videos, learning from the curriculum, hearing from speakers, reading the books by the pe people who are actually doing this work. Mm -hmm. Don't just read from the critics and the propagandists that are out there who tell you all these lies about conversion therapy. Like... Go to the actual direct sources and find out, well, what do you actually do in your session? Mm. And find out, oh, this is just good therapy. That's what we're doing. So. Great, great. Well, thank you so much, Andrew. Looking forward to meet you more and to get to listen to your presentations. <laughs> thank you so much, Victor. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, man. All right. Wow.